All right, everybody. Time to get into the zone. Stretch it out. Deep breaths. I should use it. this time to practice my edge breathing. There you go. <laughs> A man of culture, I see. My friends, welcome back to another episode of Man vs. World. And so last week we launched the new God Mode Operating System Guide. And if you haven't picked it up yet, make sure you click the link in the description and grab it now. Um, it's a new perspective on high performance that I think is going to be incredibly useful to many of you guys out there. We've already gotten some really good feedback on it. Um, so yeah, it's totally free. Click the link, get it. You're going to love it. We're going to be actually uh, getting into some of that stuff, I think, today around this topic. So uh, to help me with that, we have, as always, Pete. And we are welcoming back Derek again. So how you guys doing? Glad to be here. Glad you're with us, Derek. <laughs> Thank you. you. Ready? Yeah, I am. Thank you. Right on. So I, I read through the guide this last week, and I really liked it. And there's a couple things that I wanted to talk about from that guide today. One of the things that you talk about in the guide is the importance of having a clear vision of your future self, your ideal future self. So I thought you could just share with the audience, why is that so important? Well, so I want to share actually a little story first. All right. Um, yeah. I was working with this guy, you know, coaching him and he was dealing with a, a dead bedroom. Okay. So basically him and his wife, you know, they, they weren't having sex. And the reason for it was because his wife had a lot of uh, sexual baggage. She had some like sexual abuse and trauma and stuff like that in the past. And this was something that was causing, you know, him a lot of problems. You know, he was like, well, again, I, I want to have sex. I want to have an intimate connection with my wife. I want like all these things. And this is just, you know, knocking it down. And it wasn't, it wasn't him. Okay. Like it wasn't his, like, it wasn't like he didn't have game or, or whatever. And he was kind of at a loss for how to handle it. And one of the things that I, you know, gathered through talking with him about it is that his wife was just very stuck in the past, very stuck with, um, like where she was at with things and like how hard it is. And like, you know, these aversions and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, dude, like, she's not like, does she even have a vision of like what a good sex life with you could be. Does she, can she even conceptualize it? And he's like, I don't know. And he went and he talked to her about it. And no, like she, could, she couldn't even think about it. She couldn't even bring herself to think about it a little bit because it's like it seems so far away from where she was at. And what that really was was someone who was letting their past define their future. And so it's like because she had this stuff happen in the past, it – prevented her from moving forward, right? Like her whole future life, her marriage, you know, if it was even going to last was just completely anchored in stuff that, you know, you can't even help. It was stuff that's, you know, it's in the past, it's gone. And so I was like, man, you got to, you got to get her thinking about this future because until she can have a vision of it, until she can see something that she wants there, then nothing's going to change. And that's what he did. He started, you know, talking with her about this and, you know, really being, open and like, you know, gentle with her and, and just getting her to just open up her mind and imagine like, well, what could it be like, you know, for sex to be good? What could it be like to have, you know, an enjoyable, intimate relationship with me? And it's like, as soon as she started to do that, it started to change. Like they actually started to be able to reconnect and um, have sex and this kind of thing. And then, uh, you know, last I left it with him is he had a really fantastic sexual relationship with her. And so this is kind of like the key for everything. It's like your vision of the future self is like it's the thing that will pull you forward. And if you have it's like a, in a lot of ways, it's almost like a, it's a commercial and a, uh, <laughs> a compass at the same time. It's going to 
like tell you which direction to go and it's also going to like pull you it's going to be like a magnet it's going to make it like if the, and the vision's strong enough it's almost like irresistible you know i i've got you know me and derek have built this incredible vision for what we're trying to do here uh with the business and it's like i, I can't stop thinking about it i can't stop working on it because i'm so excited about it so like the future vision is taking that and and applying it directly to your conception of your own self so that when you think about the man that you want to be, you get fired up, you get all all jazzed and juiced and you're like you're you're ready to get going and become that man. And if you don't have that, like if your thought of your future self is either non-existent or it's uninspiring, then you are leaving the bulk of your potential and power, you know, on the table. I'll, I'll add a little to that. Um, if we really think about like anything that you do, like when you want to do anything, right? Like you want to create something or you just literally just want to wake up at six in the morning, right? You have to like imagine, okay, I'm going to wake up at six and then I'm going to, because I'm going to do this and that, right? Um, or perhaps you're out with your buddies and you're having some drinks and you think, oh, I'm going to be up at six. I got to be good for this and that. And then you, and then you decide I'm not going to have any more drinks. Right. So like we're actually doing this all the time. It's just we're talking about doing it in a way that's deliberate and that's actually um, like really powerful. So lightly thinking about the 24 next 24 hours, that's pretty easy because it's like so short term. Like we can. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow it's, you can you can remember what yesterday was. So it's pretty easy to remember what, or to think of what tomorrow is going to be like. So we're doing it all the time. So it's just a matter of like, OK. What if we just stretched that out? What if we went out like another six months? What if we did another year, another two years, three years or whatever? Um, and then it's about the degree of how much you're connected with it, because the more that you're connected with it through thought. So just kind of imagining the, the vision and then and then uh, emotionally connecting. Like that's where things start to really get like super powerful. So we're talking about getting clear and then actually getting really connected to this thing because you're already doing it. anything that you've created in your life you did this in some way shape or form you know if you right. got that job that you didn't that you wanted you had to do this in some way so we're always doing it it's just the way our psychology is the way our brains work we're just talking about actually being deliberate about it well i mean i think not everybody's always doing it i would say especially not the ideal future self a no, lot no, of times when people are like doing it yeah. in their own Yes. Everything you've created like, has come out, mainly has come out of that. You know? Right. And so the, the thing that we're trying to distinguish from here is like one where your future self is basically just your past self moved forward a little bit. Because that's where you start running into the biggest limitations when like, it's like, oh, well, I've always, you know, I've been this unproductive guy or, you know, I was bad in school. I'm not that smart. It's like you take these narratives from the past and you use them to build your future. And when you do it like that, um, you know, you're building a very limited future. This is why it's so dangerous um, and damaging to like tell kids that they suck at stuff because like that like idea that, hey, this is the kind of person you are uh, because you failed at this or whatever, then that limits their whole like life until, you know, hopefully they come across something that causes them to shift it and, and really open up that view. Yeah, most of the 20th century was uh, psychology was based around determinism, this thought of determinism. Um, we're, we're basically, you know, it's like a domino uh, where the way that you were in your past is going to determine what your future is like, determinism. So uh, with positive psychology um, and all the new stuff that they've really kind of been, you know, learning, um, this, is, this is where the future self idea kind of comes from. This is realization that... Uh, yeah, we, we, we have a lot more control over our future than than we ought to than we think. Yeah. And the, it's not even like it's a new idea necessarily. Uh, I think that like ultimately like the so you take the Christian, you know, belief system, um, you know, it's this idea that you're meant for perfect, total bliss and union with God. OK, it's like that's like the ex the most extreme ideal vision. And if you like start viewing yourself as someone who's like made for that. Um, 
it has a dramatic impact on the way that you can show up. And so it's like this incorporation of the spiritual aspect, I think, is kind of our unique twist on the whole concept. There's this guy on YouTube who looks like Kurt Cobain, but he's this woo woo guy, the spiritual guy. Okay. And whenever I, you know, I'm tempted always to think about those kind of dudes, the white dudes with dreadlocks, those kinds of guys, Okay. you know, who talk about manifestation and things like this. That's where, that's where I go to a lot of the time. But I think that robs us of pulling the truth out of that, which is when you think about your future self, when you conceptualize your future self, it does kind of pave a way to do that. Do you understand oh. why that's the case and what the distinction is between the woo woo white dudes with dreadlocks and what you're talking about? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in some ways they're similar, you know, it's like you're thinking about the things that you want and that sort of thing. But like a lot of times where like, at least what I've seen in the, the secret or the manifestation stuff is like, it's very focused on um, like abstracts, like, Either either too abstract, it's like, I am a being of pure light. Um, mm. I am rich and powerful and loved. Um, it's like that kind of stuff. Or it's like, I have a multi-million dollar mansion. I've got, you know, 10 supermodel girlfriends or whatever. Right. And really what we're talking more about is we want to zero in on the man that you want to be. Like that, that guy, that's the, that's the foundation point, because if we can start understanding him and we'll, I'm sure we'll get into like the, the different elements of how we might do that. Um, if you can get a hold of like what that guy looks like, what it, what it feels like to be him, et cetera, it's from him that you can start extracting like, okay, if that's the way that like I want to be, then what are the other goals that are going to support that? You know, what what does that mean for my the career that I'm going to pursue? What does that mean for the relationships I'm going to pursue? What does that mean for, you know, the the way that I do my fitness, my diet, like all of these kinds of things. It all is a waterfall from this core point. And if you don't have this core point like set up in a way that's really resonant and expi- and inspiring to you, then um, you know, you, you're just going to basically not create that <laughs> you're going to not create the thing that the life that you want most it's it's guaranteed you won't accidentally get the life that you want most okay it's gonna it, the only way you're gonna get that is if you get this part nailed down yeah I, yeah that makes sense i really love that that distinction between making uh like focusing the, the on the hierarchy of like where you start is the man you want to be like the and we talk about that in the in the guide and uh, in, in our work is that that's a huge difference than than most other what other people are talking about because normally it, it is like like you said starting with the external so this is we're starting with the internal starting with like who who's the man that you want to be that's a big difference than just starting with the not that the external is, doesn't matter because it totally does it's part of the whole process but you don't start from there um, then everything is a lot more powerful because then every because it implies that your value and of the man you want to be isn't dependent upon the external so what, why does that matter? Because right now you actually have access to it. Right. You don't ha- necessarily have access to the mansion or the cars no. or the whatever. And it's <laughs> totally okay and good that you might want that. I mean, that's for you to discern and figure out with your resonance tracking and everything like that. But let's assume it is good. Then it's not dependent on that. And that's a huge, huge distinction that can actually get you feeling amazing right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which and it really can cool. actually keep you feeling good even if shit goes sideways right. i mean it's like if the grid goes down i don't think any of us are going to be getting our supercars or anything like that okay it's like but you can still be this man that you want to be yeah. you know you can be the the king of the uh the compound that you built to, to ward off the the radioactive mutants or whatever it is that happens it's just like that's <laughs> like it's adaptable it's adaptable yeah. to whatever life throws at you and the the part um pete that you're talking about with the uh the hippie stuff or whatever, like, trust me, I've been there. <laughs> um, but like, the really cool thing about our faith, really, is, is uh, you know, we can look at other perspectives and even religions or, or other worldviews and see that there's truth in, there can be truth in a lot of things. And we just, you know, we feel that our uh, the truth is the most full in, in ours, right? So with that perspective, we can still love and take all the good that's that's out there in the world, right? So nothing's wrong with visioning uh, because you're doing it anyways. 
<laughs> um, right. So it's like, you do have to be surgical with some of the stuff, with everything in life, really. You got to go, okay, what is the good? Because this happens like with a lot of different things in life. Um, I mean, a lot, because you could be, you have one experience that happens bad, you know, for you with maybe a girl that you're dating. And then the next time you see a girl with, uh, let's say, blonde hair, because the first girl had blonde hair, that heart that hurt you. You hate all you blondes. You hate all blondes. You know, you can't do that. No you blondes know? for me. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> He's like, I will be the only blonde. <laughs> so, so yeah, I would, I would encourage to practice being able to surgically remove the good out of anything, anywhere you see it. <laughs> That's yeah. an excellent point. Yeah, in Habaka, 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 however you say it, two two says, write the vision, make it plain. And interestingly, the Hebrew word for imagination, Yetzer, literally means conception. Yeah. So that. if you think that this all was based off of New Age stuff, it's a lot older than that, my friend. It's well, a lot older that's a than great that. point. Well, that's a great point. And we can take that even further and tie that into like one of the main themes of like you know the content I've been putting out for the past decade is is this idea of uh, like making love to life, okay? If like yeah. the, the, the heart of making love to life, like what you're trying to do is impregnate reality with your will. And so it starts, the conception of that <laughs> is speak, in the imagination. Mark, speak, It is in this, <laughs> like, so it's like you, you bring out that conception word, that's literally like what they were hitting at. It's like, this is how you implant the seed of your will into reality. Yeah, love that. If that's passionately beautifully deep <laughs> <laughs> all right so i'm in i want to build this ideal future self where do i start it's a good question so probably the most important thing to start with is your beliefs okay because your beliefs pretty much determine everything else that comes you know around it and beliefs uh, in general it's like talking about your beliefs and self-development it's like kind of like this boring thing it's like oh you got a chapter on beliefs okay i'm gonna skip that and go to the next thing but um because <laughs> it's like we we all think we we know what we're supposed to be doing with that but i want to key in on like some very specific ones uh that are incredibly powerful and we talked about a little bit of one of them last week which is this idea of inherent dignity okay it's like this idea that like if you believe that you have inherent unconditional worth and value that puts you in a different playing field than the people who don't because the people who don't believe that they're constantly having to try and earn their worth and when they behave poorly or uh, deficiently or they get rejected or whatever their actions then tend to reflect their most immediate status interaction you know they basically uh, they it's like oh they get dumped by their girlfriends so they go and drink it's like, oh, she rejected me. I suck. And so instead of caring for themselves, they just try to escape themselves. It's like, I do suck. Oh, okay. Um, or it's that guy who like feels like he, if he doesn't land that business deal, then you know he's he's garbage or whatever it is. It's like that whole lifestyle comes from your belief system. And so like understanding your inherent worth and that sort of thing, I think is immensely powerful. But there's a couple other ones there that I think are really important too. Like. One is the idea that, you know, if you have, like, I personally, I think this one's insane, is that the heart of God mode is this idea that you have, you're a child of God, you know, this omnipotent, loving creator of the universe. He made you in his image, and he has incredible things in store for you, and he has your back, and he'll guide you along your journey if you just let him. And so the person who believes that is going to make very different decisions than the person who doesn't. Okay, they're going to be able to take things on more faith and trust, particularly when they have a system for listening to and following that, you know, the, the small, soft voice of God, which we teach as resonance tracking. It's going to give them a, a, like a compass through life. Okay, um, and we talk a lot about that in the God mode uh, operating system guide. And then probably the, the third one, the one that, you know, I'm most jazzed about right now is this idea that like, particularly us as men, like our duty in life is to acquire as much power, influence, and status as we can like righteously and like fruitfully wield. Okay. It's like, we are not, we are meant to be playing offense. It is your moral imperative to go out and to conquer. And this is going to look different for every person. You know, for some guys, it might mean a nine to five and like running like a, a beautiful family. 
Okay. For other guys, it might be mil building a multi-million dollar business. Um, you know, for other guys, it might be going to on a like the like do, running a nonprofit or something like that. Like, there's a million different ways in which that can play out. But if you believe that that's what you're called to, and literally what you're made for, like if you look at male biology. I think you can make that argument. Like we are hormonally configured to feel our best, be our strongest, be our most fulfilled, have the most genetic success in terms of reproductive options if we are driven in acquiring status and power. Okay. And ultimately it's, you know, we want to wield that virtuously because if we believe in the dignity thing, then we have to care about everybody else. You know, it's not just dignity for me, it's dignity for everybody. So we're always trying to create a win-win in the way that we acquire power. And it's actually becomes an act of service for you to like, and that's what we're, I think, struggling with so much in the modern world today is that hey, can we've I, can got I just jump in real quick. Sure. Just because yeah, yeah. I think that there's just a huge, uh, misunderstanding of, of, of just all that like that's so true and good and i think what most people do is <laughs> kind of what we talked about earlier about the surgically taking out like because a lot of people will take that and then they'll think oh man he's talking about going out and even though you said it clearly that it wasn't <laughs> it's not what you mean and what you mean is um that it's done virtuously it's done with dignity um and all this good stuff st people will still have a hard time hearing it I know and then going oh he doesn't mean just like ruthlessly trying to be as rich as possible so it's like really just want to take that moment to just to say hey it's actually it actually looks unique for every person and it's not the way you think of the word of power and and accumulate th it, it all the things that might come to mind when you hear those words it's actually probably not that those things um, well, that's particularly for Christians. I feel like they struggle with that um, more than anyone else. But the problem is, like, if they let that, th like, there's two, re there's a reason why they do that, and then there's a big consequences consequence of that. Like, the reason why I think a lot of Christians do this is because, um, well, I mean, obviously, you know, a, a corrupt pursuit of power leads to really bad things. But um, I think another reason is that it frees them from responsibility. They get to be mediocre and play life small. And if you take this belief seriously that you're meant to do great things um, in your own unique way, uh, then you have a responsibility to like get your ass in gear. <laughs> and a lot of guys they don't they don't like that pressure. Um, but the 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 consequence of not holding this belief is basically you get the world that we have today, where the only people pursuing power are the corrupt ones. And that leads to major problems. You know, that leads to all of these, you know, horrible people running the world because they're running essentially unopposed. And like, I want to change that. And I think we're meant to change that. I believe it's our moral imperative to change that. So, you know, that's a set of kind of the beliefs that if you start setting these kind of foundations, everything that comes next is going to be able to, you know, operate at a higher level. Yeah. What? So you got the beliefs down. Yep. So it's like, okay, I know what I need to believe. Is there anything else that goes into it? Yes. So the next thing is you want to try and learn how to discern your callings in life. Okay. So this is, um, you could think of it as like maybe, you know, the, the things that, that pull on your heart that feel important to you. So you can have multiple callings. You know, I'm, I'm called to, you know, be a husband and a father. And I felt that. And I wasn't always sure about that. You know, a funny story is that when I was, uh, young, you know, I always <laughs> had this, like, like, I went to Catholic school, and so they would always have, like, these uh, mission speakers, basically, like, priests coming in and uh, telling us, like, their vocation story about how they, uh, like, decided to become a priest and everything, because they were trying to get, you know, more priests, and their story was all the same. It's like, oh, I didn't want to be a priest, but, you know, because I didn't want to be a priest, I knew, like, like, and I kept feeling this calling, and, oh, it turns out I was supposed to be a priest, and I was like, well, I don't want to be a priest. Does that mean I'm supposed to be a priest? <laughs> and so <laughs> it's like, every it, it's <laughs> gone through this Catholic. <laughs> yeah, and so I kept, like, feeling this. It's like, oh, I don't, I, I don't know, and it wasn't until... I like let myself seriously consider it. it's like, all right, God, let's have a real conversation about this. Do you really want me to be a priest? If so, I will become one. And it was when I fully let myself consider the option, all of a sudden the desire and the feeling obligation just completely disappeared. And it was from there that I became very certain I was called to be a father. Um, 
you know, and as I got older and older, um, I realized I wanted to do something big in the world. I wanted, you know, as a little kid, I just like always wanted to be a superhero. And I was like, as I got older, it's like, I want to try and find my version of that in real life. And the first place I saw that was with, you know, helping guys quit porn. And now it's with the, the God mode stuff. Um, and so like, these are all callings that, you know, I've discerned in my heart, the things that I'm pulled toward. And, and sometimes they're, they're very abstract. I remember before I like found my niche with helping guys quit porn, it just felt like there is this big pull to do something as meaningful as I possibly could, like to help a lot of people at scale. That's what it felt like. It was just like this, like, it drove me nuts. Like it, uh, I remember in college, like my, my wife, Holly, like she, she would crack up at me because like one day I was going to be like, oh, well maybe, uh, maybe I'll be like a, a, a writer or maybe I'll be like, I'll just like master sales. Cause I'm good at psychology or, you know, what? I think I should probably be an FBI agent. And I was just like all over the place. I was nuts <laughs> until I was able to like dial it in. I was just like, I knew there was something I was being pulled to and I paid attention to it and I kept giving it energy and, and attention and, and space until it started to crystallize and crystallize. And that's, that's what your callings are is these like, these internal yearnings and pulls at you that if you stay with them, they will crystallize into something that really helps you orient like who you are, like what role you're going to play in this world as a man. Yeah. And you know, you, I couldn't help think about the concept of dignified sacrifice because for you to, um, cause I had a similar experience with the whole, like, you know, okay, God, let's have this conversation. <laughs> um, and I remember it and I, it was, it was only a few years ago because I came back to the faith five years ago. So it's like, um, but it was this, I did have to sacrifice because like I was, I wasn't, it was like the whole, you know, sacrifice in the Bible, like the story with, uh, uh, David, no, is it David? Uh, and with this, Isaac, right? Where he just has to kill. It's like, yeah. you, you kind of have to like yeah. be willing to, uh, you know, so it was this sacrifice of, okay, I'm going to say that, okay, I will, if you want me to. And just that yeah. act of take, of giving that sacrifice it actually opened up the true desire, which was for me, like, you know, marriage and, and family and, uh, you know, business building and stuff like that. Like that, all those desires that were actually like the most real desires were just like, they're always there, of course, but it's like now they were like more free. And it was out of that act of sacrifice that actually had, had me go through this transformation of like moving even more into what I truly desire and what God has for me. So yeah, it's like it, that's, that's needed for for all parts of the journey. That's why it's at the center of the framework um, visually, because that's where the actual action happens, where we move into right. that and then we move towards the future self. Yeah, and it's like I want to put this into more psychological terms, but first I'll do like the spiritual terms. The spiritual idea is like in Christianity is that you know God has a plan for you, okay, and that it's it's great. Okay, but it's something that you probably can't even conceive of, or maybe can't conceive of. Maybe it's something that he wants for you. It right now it doesn't even sound appealing to you. It's just like this this far out thing. But if we're gonna put this in like more psychological terms, um, like Jung sort of talked about this with the self. Like he talked about like the self with the capital S as something that you could only experience at like looking at it. It wasn't like you experienced the self as if it was like a internal experience, like as if like you were being the self. It was like something you almost had to view as outside of you. Because like the idea is that the your the storehouse of who you really are is something beyond even just your own conscious comprehension. So so anytime you touch it, it's gonna be as if you're touching something outside of your experience. And so like whether you call it God or you call it the self, you, there has to be this openness to sacrificing for whatever that higher power is calling you to. Because if you don't do that, if you don't open your mind to that, then you're going to be limited by really what you know. And the all the best stuff for you, a lot of it is going to be outside of what you know. And so we have to learn how to like artfully create that opening to that insight to flow into you. Otherwise you are always going to be kind of limited by that past self we were talking about. That is so interesting because about two years and three months ago, I was sat on a dirt road on a hill with a motorized bicycle between my legs, 
looking out over Route 66 in Southern California. And I had a helmet on with a visor, and it was a mirrored visor, and I cut, and I closed the visor as I was standing there with my buddy to show to hide the fact that I was crying from him. And the reason I was crying was because that was day two of what was supposed to be a three-day trip and film shoot that obviously was going horribly, horribly wrong. Oh, God. And as I sat there, I was, I was pissed off because I worked really hard to make this work. And I thought I had everything I needed. I had everything I said I needed, but I wasn't good enough to make it happen. Hmm. And as I sat there, I just decided, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with this. And when I got home and I was praying about this, I was like, God, I was doing this for you. I was doing this for you. And it wasn't an audible voice, but it was a voice that was not mine that sprung up from here and made it to here that said this, Peter, I don't want your work. I want you. Mm. That's what it means to be a living sacrifice. And that's what it talks about in Romans 12, 1. Sometimes wine tastes better when you're thirsty. <laughs> you just got to get real thirsty. That's very true. Look at you, Pete. Fine young man. <laughs> what, he is, he's such a strapping young lad. I'm so happy to have Any him. Any single with ladies us. out there? <laughs> yeah. Damn. No, don't. That's no, awesome. don't. No, no single ladies for Pete. He's our. He's our little work monkey. I don't need him distracted. <laughs> Wait, so, no distractions. So Pete, let me try to understand. There was a piece that I'm not sure I got though. Um, yeah. What was the like? What didn't work? What was not working when you were on the hill looking down at the? Did I miss something? Well. I was on a film shoot for a very specific project and I only had one usable shot after two days of filming. Okay. I so finished that trip. Which means that's a failure, right? I finished that trip with no cameraman because he had to leave because it took too long. Okay. What, what, are you, what were you trying to shoot here? Like some sort of bike tricks or something? It was a road trip from Los Angeles to Vegas on a two-stroke motorized bicycle kit that we put together okay. from China. It's a hundred bucks. Okay. We're he had like a vlog make it. for a while, like where he did like all this stuff and like filmed it and put it on YouTube. That's how I, you know, vetted him. It's like, all right, he kind of already knows his way around YouTube okay. and stuff like that. So you were doing this and you felt like failure, like this isn't working. Correct. And then you, that's when you had that moment where you're like, God, I'm doing this for you. And he's like, yeah. I just want you. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. He didn't want it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a Which, very that's a very profound um, lesson for you to have. Yeah. Well, three months later, I got hired by Mark. Yeah. Exactly. There you go. That's what, that's what's so cool. Um, and didn't see that coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and so when we're when we're doing this sacrifice, right, and we're um, we're we're doing the God mode, this kind of stuff starts to happen, right? Like, um, I didn't I didn't plan. I had like I had ideas. But the details of the of the plan, uh, the way things are going right now, me being part of this, wasn't that wasn't part of my. I didn't I didn't think that up. So what you were saying, Mark, around like leaving the room for the unknown, like that's what's that, that's like the. That's the one big piece that we're trying to offer here with as far as the beliefs is like, can you leave room for this? Good loving you know, possibility. And we, we, for us, that's God, like, you know, because we're being held by him. So, uh, and without that belief, it's so hard to, to leave this space for it, because you might just be opening yourself up to terror and horror and yeah. absolutely like, you know, hard, like very, very tough circumstances. Yeah. And it just feels way too hard unless you believe that there's something on, on the other side that's going to kind of, you know, make sure everything works out okay. Yeah. And, and I have um, friends who are you know, not Christian and they still, they have that belief in life. Mm -hmm. They'll say it like that. I have that, you know, I believe in life, that life will provide, life will, pro you know, everything happens for, for my benefit and something. That's great. Good. Um, of course, you know, we can argue that there's even more to it than, you know, there's more degrees of having this actual personal relationship with God. But I mean, um, <clears throat> anyway, there's, there's just a lot there. Um, 
as far as having this belief that you know you're being taken care of anyway that's that's my thought on that so bringing it back to the ideal future self right we have callings mm -hmm. and then we also have this thing that you call style mark could you break down what you mean by that sure so style is a fun one um this is this is probably my favorite part like just on a like emotional level um so style it includes like your values okay that's like one piece of it and you know it's like all right how much do you value work time versus family time how much do you value you know a specific a specific moral set or whatever okay um that's all part of it but like that only gets you so far it needs to like evolve beyond just like these big things like uh like do you want to get married or not like that kind of stuff okay it has to like get far more personal and style is kind of like the things that really like light you up the most it's like your it's it really it's, it's your kind of um restrictions that you put upon yourself because <clears throat> all great work is accomplished through constraint okay like you cannot do everything, all right. Um, no matter how much you imagine, and believe, uh, and you know, do in your like in your mind, at the end of the day, you have to choose a path. You have to choose a lane. We only have so much time, so much energy, and the constraints you put upon yourself determine what you can really accomplish, right? Like, and it also really determines what you can master. So, for me, you know, one of the things I've really tried to continuously master and improve is like my work at YouTube, my writing, you know, I write daily emails now. Um, you know, I, I don't really do so. I, I've kind of moved away from the TikTok stuff and the short form things. It's like, you know, that's just not my lane. That's not my style. I don't really want to be chasing those kinds of trends. Um, you know, sometimes it's something that's externally put upon you, you know, like, I mean, clothing is obviously an element of style. It's like, you know, it's something that you communicate to the world with, but like, for me, it's like I've got big, goofy flipper feet that are like really wide in the toe. So it's like I can't wear cool shoes. <laughs> um, and so it's like I have to find like I have to adapt to that. You know, I can only there's only a few companies that make shirts that fit me because I'm you know tall and long torsoed. It's just like and then you learn how to work with it. I got these constraints and I can make something good out of it. Um, you know, it's like if you're going to be an artist, it's like what kind of artist? What, what medium are you going to work with? I think so often people they just try and do everything or they, they look at, they're constantly looking at what's someone who's doing good and they try and uh, switch lanes, right? Like you see someone, you're like you're, you're dedicated to building a business um, doing drop shipping, but then all of a sudden you see someone selling eBooks on Twitter and it's like, oh no, I need to be doing that and I need to be doing that and I need to be doing that. And it's like, you're just constantly searching for a path. Um, and like, if you are a very, intentionally and consciously building a relationship with your own style, you're going to be able to find your lane in life and really pursue mastery. And it's, yeah, no, you know, this style can change and evolve and you can shift lanes, but you want it to be something that, that clicks with you and that you're consciously cultivating or else you're never going to be able to really let loose your full unique character. Like you think about it like this, all right, say you just start playing the piano. Okay. And you know, you have like music playing in your head and you're trying to play it. It's like, it's, you're all going to get, you're going to capture a fraction of it, but say you spent 10 years mastering the piano, you're going to be able to play every note in that image or in that, in that imagination that you have there. And so that's why we, we have to like really dial in our style because that is a prerequisite for bringing like your highest inspiration out into the world. Or in other words, it's like, through picking your lane, that's what allows God's power to flow through you at the highest bandwidth. So it's like, you know, you put me in a situation where I have to perform brain surgery, you're not going to see any of God's work. You're not working <laughs> okay? on Yeah, you're not. Yeah, you're not seeing anything, period, ever again. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, you put me in a position where I'm coaching someone. I think you will, you know, at least to some degree, because it's something that I've been called to. It's something I've really mastered and, and put a tremendous amount of effort into. So that's what style's all about. And getting to know your style is a huge part of understanding yourself as a man. I mean, I love, I love it. Yeah. Because like, I mean, I think of the word expression. Um, you know, ever since I, um, 
Well, I've always been like that, okay? Ever since a ch I, I see like old pictures of me as a child, a kid, and I've got like some funky shirt. I'm the kid with the funky shirt. You know, I just, like I remember some of my clothes from when I was a kid. <laughs> so I was just, I'm just, uh, I, I think, so then I, then I had like my marketing business and stuff. So I was doing that like, you know, in my work um, cause there was a lot of creative sides to things. And then when I did my shoe brand, that was like this explosion of like allowing myself to just completely express, uh, what was inside. And like the, the brand was a reflection of, of, it wasn't just like a, it wasn't just a shoe. Like it wasn't just a, a visual, one visual thing. It was this representation of this feeling, this sensation, uh, inside me, like, uh, of, of this desire to of, of how I want to show up or, and, and what I would like for the world or some, something like that. So style to me, uh, it's about expression. You know, it's expressing like Pete, like the essence of Pete. How can you express that? The essence of Mark, how can you express that? And like, I've been practicing some of that and I'm continually practicing. It's like, I want to continue to do that. When I think of my future self, I think of this, man who's expressed a lot of the things within him and giving it out to the world and hopefully making businesses around it and maybe some stuff that's not about business and it's just you know maybe it's just singing in a parlor or something like that and i'm not making a dollar from it but i'm just doing it because i feel <laughs> like it you know what i mean um do you have a good voice uh, i don't know <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty uh <laughs> So I'll choose the humble card on that one. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know. I'd love to be able to explore that and have fun with it. You yeah. Um, but for my own sake, like absolutely for my own sake. Um, yeah. But it's, exp it's expression. You know, that's to me what style is about. Yeah. And I, I never would have right. thought that like in my 20s, like express, I'm expressing myself. And it's like people say that. And I, yeah. I, I guess I never really resonated with that. But now I'm truly understanding that that's really what it is. Like even the shirt I wear, like, just like how, like we're doing it in some form, right? You go to your closet and you pick a shirt. Some, for some people, it's just like, it's such a little thing and other people it's a lot. And for me, like the whole idea of wearing the same clothing, like every day for, for like minimalism, not for me, because if that <laughs> takes away a, like a huge piece of joy, you know, why would I do sure. that? Because that's my style. And I think like this style aspect really it's almost mandatory uh, to enjoy a Christian life um, or even anyone who believes in a, you know, benevolent higher power. Because like, if you don't, like, if you believe that like the, the creator of the cosmos made you, well, then you're something special. But if that specialness is not being displayed in some lane, somewhere, somehow, well, it's like, how do you, how do you reconcile that? with your conception of God. It's like, That's you know, right. by believing that you are this truly, you know, unique thing, this universe unto yourself, then that means that there is like depths to your character, your, your vibe to your, you know, unique aesthetic that is really one of the greatest treasures to uncover. Mm -hmm. You know, like the more that I discover who, who I am, the more I love being me because mm -hmm. I know what I like. I know what I want to be good at. I know how to express myself, how to be useful, how to find my place in the world, how to interact with people, how to find friends. All of this stuff stems from self-knowledge. And, um, you know, a lot of people are just constantly looking for the external world to tell them what to do. You know, they're, they're constantly looking yeah. for some uh, guru to tell them who they are. And, of course, you can always learn from people. They can give you options to explore. But at the end of the day, if you don't go through those options, be like, well, how much does this actually click with me? Um, then you're never actually discovering who you are. You're just like building this like superficial mask based upon neediness and approval. Bam. What Derek touched on with creating that feeling, I think is really key for this because you can take a purely visual approach. Even let's take your wardrobe, for example, you could take a visual look at your wardrobe and say, these all go together. Or you can say, and you'll look cohesive, but maybe you won't be communicating that feeling as accurately as if you would say, what's the feeling that I want to embody? And then take note, oh, this thing gives me that. 
and then you look over here, this kind of seemingly unrelated thing in a different style, perhaps style, but it gives you that same feeling. And then you take this piece from over here and this piece from over here. And now you just made a new genre. Yeah. And that you think? is resonance tracking. That's what we, hey. that's, that's what we teach. <laughs> and it's like, it applies to everything. Like me and Derek were this morning just talking about like, how do we want to construct like, you know, some business offers and stuff. And like, we were kind of given this path by, you know, our, our coach, she's like, it should go like this. Um, but I like, just wasn't, wasn't fully clicking or we running into some issues. And it's like, well, how's this work? Like th this, this over here feels a lot better. Um, this resonates more with the, the thing we're trying to express the values we're trying to honor all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, we, you start working with that and it's like, it's your key to problem solving in a lot of ways is what you're describing. <clears throat> yeah. And we, and we identified certain things that we were sure of our expression. Like, yeah, it's like, with pizza that's too. our style. Yeah. We, we had to figure out what those things, some of those things were. Um, and it's like what Pete was saying with like the shirt or in the pants together. It's like, okay, well, you know, you don't feel like wearing black today. Okay. So you know that today your expression isn't black. It's like, try to find what the thing that you're, that there's a lot of resonance with that you're like, okay, boom, I know this is true. So how can I work with that? Um, you know, that's kind of what we did this morning is we, we found a couple of things that we were like, mm, we want it to be this way. We do know that. And then by doing that, it kind of through the creativity, through constraint, like we talked about earlier, it, it, got, it eliminated a lot of things. Like, okay, well, if that's the case, then all that stuff is off the table because we know very sure that this is the thing. And so this is kind of finding your style, right? This is like part of the yeah. process. It just hit me like when you don't do this, this is how you become an NPC. <laughs> yeah. Because like... Because like literally when you're an NPC, what you're doing is you're just looking, you know, out at the culture and being like, who am I supposed to be? You're letting culture like tell you who you're supposed to be. But the problem with this is if you actually, put, you know, cre create that mask of a persona that's cobbled together by what you think is, you know, supposed to be right. You are going to be constantly walking around in a state of like internal dissonance. You're not going to have any of your own ideas. You're just going to be like regurgitating other people's opinions. You're not going to be expressing yourself at all. And like, this is why NPC ish people don't do anything. This is why they can't really offer anything to the world. Uh, and they, and it's why they, they struggle so much to like develop willpower, uh, change their habits, transform their lifestyle because they are so internally conflicted and they don't even know it because they've cut off access to their own internal source of inspiration. And so it's like, you know, it's like if you like to to be operating at your highest power, it's like you have to be letting that that nature, that vibe, that spirit, that style, whatever you want to call it, that's in baked into your DNA be flowing as freely as possible. And the more stamped down it becomes, the the more of an NPC or even like a dysfunctional kind of virus in society you become. Yeah. Hey, I, I just thought of something like, I think with every decade of like your life, you know, your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, like there's this general um, kind of things that people go through. You know what I mean? And I think our, the 20s is like, when we're most susceptible to this, like to the negative sides of this. Um, I still was like doing, I was still in my style or whatever to some degree, but I think generally over life, you start to discover that just through osmosis of being in life, <laughs> you know, yeah. you start seeing. So I think for people in their twenties, especially, uh, there's, they're, they're more susceptible to, uh, being off the style because it's the time where we're, where we're like, we want to, we, we use the culture to create the persona. I know of my, my life a hundred percent. I used it to create the persona of like Derek that I wanted to portray to the world. And then I did a lot of work to try to emphasize that. And, and some of that, maybe most of it is still actually my persona now, like what I want, but there was a lot of pieces that were not. And it was, constructed from the culture because that's what we're that's kind of how we're raised um so if you really want to like make the biggest uh you know leaps forward in this like just take it seriously um 
and you're going to have to you're going to have to fight through your biological you know uh, situation you're in as a 20 year old 25 year old yeah because wanting that group affirmation and whatnot yeah and i think it's just part of the biology i think i i don't know for sure but um something yeah like you said probably they're maybe they're more biologically uh um relying on social acceptance or something like that versus when you're in your 40s let's say well this is i think it's really dependent it goes back to that point about how open are you to the the will of god in your life because mm -hmm. it's like for me i was in my 20s i was trying to find this niche i was trying to find this path my my style or whatever and it was like oh help these guys quit porn like how you just quit porn i was like what <laughs> I don't want to be the porn guy, <laughs> but so it's like, you know, I was able to do something that was like at the time in particular, very countercultural and uncomfortable for my friends and family. And even for yeah. me sort of at times, but it was only because I was like really listening to that voice and I was like allowing that to, to inspire me. And it, it turned out, you know, that was exactly what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. We're all glad you did too. <laughs> Thanks. Amen. Yeah. So let's say you do the work, you know, you, you're like, okay, I'm going to craft this, this future image, this ideal future self. And you try it out for a while and you think it's really compelling, but when you're trying to put it to use, it doesn't really give you that motivational drive that you thought it would. Mm -hmm. What do you do about that? So that's almost always a case of being too much in your intellect. So, you know, the God mode guide, you know, you just like we explain it in detail, but like really what we're looking for resonance is this balance between instinct and intellect, both of them together. And when you construct a, a vision of your ideal future self and it's too much intellect, um, it's not going to move you. OK, and usually it's a, it's like a conglomeration of all the things you think you should do, all the things you think you should want. OK, and as soon as you feel that should voice, you know, telling you what to do, uh, that's your intellect. And it's not something we want to discard necessarily, but we actually don't want to let that completely govern everything that we do. The intellect shouldn't be really offering you direction. The intellect should be offering you options. The intellect should be telling you the truth. The intellect should be running simulations and crunching numbers. Okay, that's what we use our intellect for. It does not, it's not the captain. The captain should be our instincts. Now, we always want our instincts to be properly informed by our first mate of our intellect, but ultimately again, we want to be able to choose. That gets, again, this is something that gets like, that can be very easily misunderstood yeah i'm gonna explain the yeah. flip side in a yeah, second yeah 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 so i just want to another like uh you know warning sign bing, bing, bing. <laughs> yeah right so it's like we've got the, like if you're too much on the um intellect side you know you're going to be having all the stuff you should do and it's going to be making you feel like uh you know i don't really want to do this this just feels like a chore it just feels like a grind okay so Intellect, just produce options, run numbers, run simulations, you know, tell the truth, okay? And if you're telling the truth to yourself and it's like, hey, that path over there is going to lead to this thing you don't want, guess what? You're not going to be able to, that's going to change the way you instinctually feel about something. So you can trust your, your emotions will respond to the truth as long as you make the space to consider it. But ultimately, we want that instinct to be really... Uh, crafting a big part of this vision that's what we're we're being able to tell it's like oh this the, out of these options here that one mm, that gives me the most juice um now this can go too far where you're going super instinctual and at that point like you're gonna be neglecting the intellect it's like you see this with like you know <laughs> every kid today like so, like something like what is it 60 or 70 percent of kids they want to become like they're they're what they want to be when they grow up is like an influencer. Okay, that's like what they're all they all want to do because that's what they all watch, you know, on YouTube and stuff like that. They want to be a popular influencer or a streamer or something like that. And I'm sure some segment of them are, I mean, probably a significant segment will try it out and uh, even smaller percentage will actually do it. Um, but it's that desire to just like do the cool thing or do the thing that feels good in the moment. Um, 
what's his name, uh, Stephen Pressfield, the guy who wrote the the War of Art and uh, Going Pro, he calls like the, these things like shadow careers, where like you're putting a lot of time and energy in something that might be in some way adjacent to your your goal, but like not really the thing. It doesn't really make sense. It doesn't really serve your highest like values. Um, so like you know, if, if I was trying to build this business, but I'm putting all my time into making this music album. It's like, yeah, the music album, it lets me like, you know, create, like, like like tap into my creative, like desire, you know, this desire to make something good and useful, but it doesn't actually make me money and it doesn't like serve my business. It doesn't serve my family. It doesn't serve my vocation in the world. It just feels good. Um, and so we want to avoid those kinds of pitfalls as well. You know, the, the follow your bliss kind of thing. It's like, that's a, that's a trap. It's got, it's a very nuanced um, line to cross and or line to walk, and you must always be informed by your intellect as you're going through it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, hmm. it's like a little example of of, of something uh, where we're where we're doing that is like there could be uh, an int intellectually, like emotionally, you really feel instinctually, you really feel like you want to do something, but. Uh, intellectually, there's something that you know, and it's like, it's very clear that <laughs> it's just maybe not the right time. And so, but Mark also says, well, but you're being led by the instinct. So the instinct has to like receive the intellectual ideas and then, and then it gets converted. Like, you know, it's not, I think that's what you mean, Mark, by um, like having the instinct be led. Or leading the instinct, leading the intellect well, through the instinct. It's like so this. It's, it's like if you like if you have a really awesome looking sandwich there. You know, it's like looks really delicious and good. And you're like, ooh, your instincts like, I want to eat that. Okay. And if I like, well, the truth is uh, that deli meat has been out for about eight hours in the sun. It's like, ooh, what does that do to your instinctual desire for it? When exactly. I tell you that truth, so it's informing it. Now the and it changes it. Now, yeah, it changes it exactly, exactly. So and this is what like what you, you got to learn how to trust that. It's like like we people don't trust their emotions because they don't inform their emotions, and then their emotions like they they live their life trying to repress their instincts, and then their instincts then repress their intellect. And this is like the constant cycle of people trying to sprint super hard and become ultra productive, go monk mode, build a million habits. Then they burn out, and then they just binge on you know Fritos, porn, and like uh, video games. Okay, and they just cycle between these things because. You know, you have to bring them both together at the same time. It's like you can't like you think about all of that, you know, trying to take everything on at once instinctually. You're like, shit, that's like too much. I don't want to do that. <laughs> and I think with you, with your, you know, 10 years of working with men to quit porn is where you have a very, very unique, um, you know, view and experience with this in refining these ideas around this bringing intellect and instinct together. Um, with this problem that's unique to all of human history, quitting right. porn, you know, so uh, for many, many reasons. But like, that's what I'm excited about, like, you know, what you bring to the table in this whole thing is like, that's, you've got like a unique angle on this, um, all, all these concepts, this whole framework is being built upon this kind of experience that you've had with this, with, with such a unique crappy situation that men have been in so um so rest assured that the tools being used to do this is really well um forged it's been made on the battle on one of the greatest battlefields in spiritual warfare for you know maybe a history <laughs> not to be grand yeah, it's a wild but, one. Uh, it's, uh, i think that's that's how i see it yeah, well, thank you. That's that's how I see it too. I mean, like the the porn thing is weird. It's a very strange problem where it pits your instincts against your intellect in a very very uh, intense way. And so, yeah, you, like learning how to get them on the same page, it's it's a bit of an art form. But like, there's you know, we've we've extracted processes for it, um, and that's kind of like where God Mode was born. Was like, okay, well, hey, I like learned some pretty cool shit, like helping guys quit porn, and it applies to way more 
than quitting porn. Like I've been using it to, you know, turn myself into the man that I want to be. And like, uh, for a long time, and I've been seeing like guys who quit porn and work with me, they go, they go beyond this. They go to build their businesses. They go to get their relationships. They, you know, make money, they get incredible shape. Like this, this stuff is, uh, expansive. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we should probably call it there. Like, you know, guys, I hope you really enjoyed this conversation hearing more about, uh, the God mode, operating system. We're going to have a lot more content around this. Uh, always love to see your questions, your feedback, everything like that. But if you haven't, make sure you go and actually download the guide. Read it. It'll only take you 20, 30 minutes. It's pretty short. And I, I'm telling you, it can transform your life. You start putting this at the, at the center of how you go about living. You're going to unlock a level of passion, clarity, focus that you've never had before. I mean, like I don't I can't believe I functioned so long without knowing this stuff. Um, I mean, actually, I can because you know the way you do it is you just you suffer a lot <laughs> and you make a lot of mistakes. So that's how you do it. Um, but you don't have to. Uh, so check out the guide. And uh, thanks for listening. Ooyap, everybody.